Thank you. Um, so we have Alpha now for questions. Um, I tried to gather a few questions during the talk and from the Twitter. I will I will just ask two of them and then we can go for like the. Um, so m there was actually a few technical questions which I think maybe it's not really um, necessary to address them here and I will invite everybody to go and talk to Martin. Um, there were uh, a few questions on um, for like IBM in particular. Um, there was the question of uh, the permission blockchain. So, and I guess this is related with the uh, discussion uh, from BitNation in the sense that as you, um, as you create a, a small and uh, less public blockchain, then doesn't it actually question or put into jeopardy the, the, the fundamental uh, property of the blockchain, which is to be public transparent, and that's where the trustlessness of the um, technology comes from. There was also a question about whether you could talk about the latest findings about alternative consensus mechanism that uh, IBM is working on. And finally, it's actually a question that someone asked me, but I will forward it to you. Um, it's about, like, uh, in the terms of IoT, you have, like, uh, devices that are not necessarily uh, really powerful. And uh, how, how do you deal with actually enabling them to process and to actually act with the blockchain? And doesn't that actually make create a lot of, like, uh, latency? Wow, that's a lot of questions. Uh, have we only got half an hour? Two minutes, right, okay. Uh, so I'm probably gonna forget the first questions in the sense that you need to remind me of it. Uh, so I'm, the th recency effect says that I'm gonna answer the third one first. So uh, IoT, obviously the devices are very small. Uh, they don't have a lot of power at the moment. That will grow over time as things change. And you know, like anything, blockchain is at a point in time where we are now is not where we will be in three, four, five, ten years. Just like somebody said about the internet and the growth there, we think the same will happen uh, in this space too. And, and IoT devices uh, today would actually not have to have a copy of the blockchain. Clearly, they wouldn't have the resources to be able to do that. It would be more about them submitting transactions that would then be recorded on a blockchain uh, is the kind of model that we would be taking there on that one. Can you remind me what the second question was, please? Uh, latest findings on the ah, Okay, so... Uh, there are multiple different consensus mechanisms. We heard a proof of work. Uh, there's proof of stake being mentioned. Ethereum is looking at that. They're about two years away, as I understand it at the moment. Uh, there is a multi-signature. There is something that Hyperledger uses called PBFT, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. And there's another one uh, that Hyperledger is working on right now. The white paper for that, covering all the details, is currently uh, on the hyperledger.org website if people want to go and have a look at that paper which covers how that will uh, add, what, what new facilities that consensus mechanism will add. But the point about all of the consensus mechanisms is about achieving agreement between the parties that have chosen to be a member of the chain. I think this is going to sort of answer the first question a little bit in the sense that, you know, uh, how does a private blockchain differ from a public blockchain and isn't that kind of taking away some of the point? I mean. It's really about what words you use to describe the technology and what benefits you're hoping to get from using a particular technology. And, you know, the, the public uh, blockchain, uh, as we see for Bitcoin today, is a single world-spanning blockchain. And it works very well for money transfer uh, type scenarios. And that's, you know, a great use case. And there are other use cases, colored coins, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and other uh, enhancements and abilities that are coming along the way. But at this point in time, it is very difficult for regulated industries to accept use of it for problems to do with AML, KYC, etc., etc. as I mentioned earlier. That leads to private blockchains between different parties who wish to do business with each other, but they hope to gain benefits from using blockchains, such as reduced costs, reduced infrastructure, etc., and by having a permissioned private blockchain between the parties that are hoping to trade or transact with each other, then they will hope to get those economies of scale. And of course, there are network effects that we, we heard about earlier. And those effects will be in proportion to the size of the network in many cases. Uh, but you know, the, what we're backing with Hyperledger under the Linux Foundation is actually you know, a, the idea that the technology will become an underpinning or a foundational technology for uh, any kind of blockchain use case, whether it's public or private, whether it's permissioned or not, 
And you know, in the same way that TCP IP underlies the internet today or HTTP underpins the web, no one organization to, you know, manages or controls that. It's, it's under the auspices of the W3C uh, and IETF. Well, we, we, know, we think the same for blockchains uh, with Hyperledger in the sense that having something that is bigger than any one party is what's really important. You know, no one organization should control blockchain. It's too big for that. And that's why we think that Hyperledger as a foundation is a good body in which to, to, to work on standards and uh, as well as the code, but also have that open governance aspect as well. I hope that answered all three. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other question I would like to ask, um, I'm going to address it to Martin, but it's actually for everyone in the panel who wants to answer, um, is about the comment on uh, the blockchain replacing Uber, eBay, and etc. Um, it seems to me that there is actually some kind of like distinction between the technical infrastructure that enable people to coordinate themselves and to transact value, but then there is also the like an additional function that is operated by centralized operator like eBay and Uber, which is actually like policing the network and making sure that the person I'm interacting with is actually the person I, I believe is or that is someone that is not going to destroy my house, etc. And so in order to actually replace Uber, eBay and the middleman in general, don't we also need an additional layer on top of the blockchain or can the blockchain itself actually resolve the question of policing the network? And I, I would invite anyone from the panel to reply. Yeah, maybe I will start. Um, so, so I would say um, first we will, will we will have reputation systems that will make a lot of things easier. And but if in the end, if, if, if we need to some degree a specific service, of course um, that that can be provided by someone, and there can be um, maybe there can even be a mar marketplace around this the service. Um, but the important thing is that those platforms. Um, they will, will technically uh, run on the blockchain, but, but it's also about o ownership. So they will, there are two options. So, so one option, they would be completely free uh, because most of those um, uh, platforms actually ha have zero marginal costs one, once they are um, implemented. So they will either be free and public uh, and be public goods, a little bit like the internet, uh, or they will um, be owned by a uh, wide uh, range um, of, of stakeholders, and I, I think um, then the government uh, governments will yeah, shift to this wide range of stakeholders, and then we are in this exciting topic of decentralized governance, and will all take a while um, to find out the right uh, mechanisms. But that's the direction I, I, I see there. Um, just on this issue of. Um the, the, the social good being achieved by combating network corporations. I mean, the, the three options you have are, it's run by a private uh, group of bros in Silicon Valley, probably about 20 people in a room, um, and it impacts the lives of uh, literally uh, billions of people, at least hundreds of millions. The strength of that system, though, is that if you actually know who you want to, if you want to change the system, there's a small group of people you can target. You know exactly who they are, and you can say, change your system. Um, and that's one of the, the interesting things about, about centralized systems is that while they are subject to abuse, they also can be subject to change quite, uh, if, if you are able to mobilize polit politically. Your uh, second alternative is the, the public, um, uh, essentially public good, uh, where a public infrastructure runs it and you have some kind of uh, democratic governance process whereby you influence the government. Um, and this third, this third option is, that's been articulated by a couple of your panel now is essentially it goes into the traditional cooperatives, which is to say, we collectively run things. One of the slight naive, naive elements of, of the original thinking around this in blockchain was the idea that if something is merely open, it makes it like a cooperative somehow. But true co cooperatives have real uh, governance processes in place. You have access to usership, you have access to the ownership, but you also have real voice in them. Um, right now, the current blockchain systems don't actually allow people real voice. The only voice you can have is whether you use it or not, essentially. Um, so I'm th I think the most interesting element of this going forward for whether this te technology could actually be a, a legitimate alternative to things like Uber is exactly this. How do you give people who use that system 
true, authentic voice in it. Um, the DAO is an interesting kind of case study. It was, it was said that you, you would have some kind of voice in it, but really it had a, a, a slightly, not to be rude about it, a kind of slightly plutocratic element, which is essentially the more tokens you have, the more voice you have. Um, and it was a particular type of voice. Um, and I think, and that's not necessarily a critique, it's just an observation. Um, going forward, I want to see a lot more thought about how do you authentically combine a blockchain system with a really cool governance system as well that you can actually empower people. Um, um, I guess uh, bring it back to how, how do you trust a community that's uh, completely decentralized? So if you remove eBay and move on to something like Open Bazaar, um, you will see a few things, which is uh, first, it's better for the merchants and the users. So as a merchant, if you list a you know product on eBay and someone purchases this product, you'll be paid your money. But to withdraw this money, you are then paying a hefty fee to take this money and use it in your own day-to-day -day life. So this is a highly unnecessary step in the process. The other step is that PayPal, it's, I mean eBay itself, uh, has fees that adds on top of it. And in a lot of cases, it's it can be directly improved. So bringing it back to Overstock uh, CEO, Sir Patrick Byron, his comment in all of this was that, you know, if you remove the middleman and you allow the customer to engage with the merchant, you create a much better relationship rather than saying, all right, you can deal with the merchant, but you have to go through me, you have to pay some fees to me, and then when you want the money to put into your account, you also have to pay a little bit more fees. And obviously these come with some guarantees, you know, they don't just offer the service without any uh, quality of service provided on top. But if you look at the actual structure of it, you can dramatically improve uh, relationships between the merchants and the customers. And you can dramatically improve the amount of money that is, uh, you know, placed in each other's hands and what will swap between the two. And you can even have systems where by protecting the system, so in the same manner that Bitcoin does it, if you look after the community, you're given a currency that you can therefore spend within the community. So imagine an eBay where you are a node and keep the eBay net, or let's say, let's say Open Bazaar, you keep it alive and you get paid a currency that you can then use within that. So you, you completely change the paradigm of how a marketplace operates and everyone is rewarded and you know obviously it will take some time before we reach a completely usable functional point open to public but open bazaar has done a great job as that and someone else mentioned that you know we don't really have a voice so in terms uh, the gentleman i then mentioned that for example bitcoin we don't really have a voice but at the end of the day, that's why we have over a thousand different coins on the market. If, if, you know, if you feel you're not being heard on a particular cu currency, you can always swap. And I think that's a much better model than the current where if I don't like the euros, or well, that's it. I don't really have another choice, do I? Um, I can't go create my own monetary system in the c current uh, model. And I guess that's, that's where your voice comes in. So if you do want to create something, as the other gentleman mentioned, that he's creating the currency circles. And... You know, I think the, these really open the doors. And if you look at the survival of the fittest, so I guess in the Darwinism terms, um, you have genes that apply to an environment, and if they're useful, they will survive and they will continue. And the ones that don't will obviously die out, given on the environment how it is. And they may not die out, they may continue to survive. So if you apply the same model to blockchain and Bitcoin and currencies that are coming through, the ones that, you know, do their job properly will stay, and the ones that don't, don't, and the ones that live... You know, they may die out, but have a good impression on the market. They may be replicated just on those aspects and apply to other successful ones. Um, so I think that's, you know, a, just the model that I like to look at it. And yeah, with DAO, it was, it was a, I, I, I don't particularly like the concept of the more you purchase, the more of a voice you have. Um, but I guess these are all the challenges that we need to learn along the way. Um, it, you know, this hasn't been done before. You couldn't guess 15 years ago that Facebook would exist today in everyone's or almost everyone's phones and it would be a method of communication. And to try and guess such a thing would just be bizarre. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, in time all these things will fall into place. And the voice is given through your ability to contribute or create your own. Right, so um, I, I guess I'll take the contrarian view again. Um, we've heard a couple of examples now, like Lazus' decentralized ride-sharing system, which is blockchain-based, and OpenBazaar's um, decentralized uh, marketplace. Um, it's not really clear to me that we're going to need any of this. Um, 
most people probably just want to get into a car. Like they just want to press their app and have a taxi right in front of them, uh, which is a well-managed app run by, you know, 20 bros in Silicon Valley. But like, I think it's a sympathetic system like to empower the people to run these companies or that sort of stuff. But do people really want this? Uh, they just want to get in a car probably. And um, it doesn't work that bad. And Open Bazaar also, I think, is a very sympathetic attempt. But people can also just, you know, run their own WordPress app and have their own store there, and it's much cheaper and much easier, probably. Or even eBay is probably very easy. Um, this, this, all these kind of decentralized companies, they don't fall out of the sky. It still requires people to really build this, and programmers are expensive, and there's not a lot of them who are willing to do this stuff for free. Um, and then you have the blockchain inefficiency, which I still think is more inefficient than a central server. It's not clear to me which problems we're solving here, even though they're um, interesting projects. Thank you. I, I, will, I will just like to answer on this that indeed there is a really big problem in terms of like the user interface and like the complexity to actually right. get into the blockchain. But on the other hand, I think most people if given the choice to having like using Facebook and giving away all their privacy or using a decentralized system which has just as a good of a user interface, they might actually would rather go to a decentralized service. Well, it seems like most people are Facebook. Because there's no alternative yet. Yep. <laughs> Anyhow. And, and the alternative won't fall out of the sky. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> we can open the, the, the device to the room. I, I would have one, one comment on, on, on this one. So I would agree. Um, most users don't care. They, they don't care whether, whether the uh, underlying thing is decentralized or not. But who, who does care, and that is important um, for creating such a, such, such a platform. So I, I said um, platforms like Uber and so on, they, they will be replaced by something decentralized. And who, who would care and who does care are other businesses and other entities. So uh, imagine you have some new idea. Um, so, I mean, you could talk my thing I'm working on, so a new prediction, a prediction market, that's something that does not really exist. And obviously we want to be the platform. We want to be the platform like, like Uber is the Uber with 80% market share. So. Uh, what's the way to do it? Okay, well, you can go to um, your favorite uh, VC in Silicon Valley, uh, try to raise a hundred million dollars. Maybe you need a billion. Uh, Uber raised what are the two, two, three billion to, to make to make this land grabs to to spend massive amounts of um, uh, uh, money to to just um, flood the whole world and get it all on your platform. Um, and but there might be a more efficient. Uh, a way to do it. So why do they need all this money? Yes, because of the advertising, because they need to uh, bring enough people on the platform, so they need to make, it's, it's kind of a coordination game and they, they, they influence this coordination game with a lot of money and advertising. The alternative way would be, well, uh, we create a decentralized platform and then, now uh, going back to the Uber example, so imagine uh, Uber would be created in a decentralized way, um, then they, the initiators, they could have g gone to, uh, to the existing taxi companies in, in the different world and say, well, uh, hello, here's our decentralized platform, and you can just um, plug in. Um, and, and those are the rules, and the rules cannot be changed. We do not control it. And I would say under those conditions, uh, it is way uh, more likely that people would agree yeah, let's coordinate on this platform. Um, so I, I like to, to make this comparison. If you're a startup, you can already do it without a blockchain. You can offer an API. But you would another, uh, another um, uh, business would never uh, build their business around an API of a startup. So it could, can be shut down. They could change the rules. They could increase the fees. But a blockchain, a smart contract, is very different. And, and that's something where it's uh, way easier to coordinate. So I would say not users, uh, but businesses are interested in, in this. Can I mention something as well? Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, I just feel like uh, the main point of this is not being mentioned, which is that 
people may not care, but they do care about saving money. They do care about uh, saving time. They do care about more security being provided when they're dealing with things. And I think those are great benefits in itself. I mean, when the internet first came out, you had to plug in the telephone line into a modem and then dial the number and then wait and log on. And people still did that. So why are they moving on from that is because a better system was designed. So for me, this all goes back to, you know, I, I may not care about having a decentralized system, but I do care that I'm paying less fees because I'm using Bitcoin. I do care that it's quicker because I'm using Bitcoin and I have more privacy and more uh, independency because of it. So that's just something I wanted to add. Cheers. Thank you. Are there any questions from the room? Yeah. Hello. My name is Monica Monaco. I run a group called the Working Group uh, Blockchain and Virtual Currencies Working Group. Um, we meet in Brussels every couple of months. Uh, members are companies. Um, I can call some of them, I don't know, BitPay, all these people. Um, I come from payments. Um, I am a consultant. I work for more than 10 years with Visa Europe, the credit cards responsible for the relations in town with Commission, Parliament and, and Council and started my consultancy three years ago. So I work for a lot of financial industry people. And I got into this thing, <laughs> Bitcoin, which is not really where I come from, um, in 2013 when I started my company because I was hired by the Bitcoin Foundation at the time uh, to do public affairs for them in town. That was 2013, not a lot of people were working on this. Uh, after seven months, they stopped this, and so I started this working group. Now, we have just been accepted to be part of the European Commission DG FISMA Payment System Market Expert Group. Um, so I wanted to, to, in this, this is just not to, I don't need any kind of publicity in payments. People know me, and I, I, this is not payments, so I frankly am not here for publicity. But I have a question coming from this background to um, Amin from BitNation. Um, you are talking about social inclusion and payments, and I understand that. I think the members of my working group understand that too, and the GFISMA uh, in the European Commission understand that very well too. So social inclusion is great, and it's nice that the blockchain and virtual currencies allow for social inclusion. The problem I have and my members of my working group have with this is KYC. Because when you go to KYC, my dear friend, uh, the issue is not uh, who is sending the money only, but also whether these people are sending money for legal aims or not. Thank you for nodding, IBM. Uh, thank you for that. So I understand where you come from, and I understand social inclusion. That's exactly why I am in this, why I'm working on this, because I think social inclusion is great. You know, Not everyone can afford to have a visa card. Uh, not every bank gives a Visa or MasterCard to anyone, and then you have to pay fees. And here there are no fees, and this is great. Uh, this being said, you still need to know who is sending money to who, for which purpose. And I understand from DG FISMA that, and DG Justice of the European Commission, we work with both the departments uh, in, in the group I chair, uh, I understand from them that there are a couple of updates to European law uh, which are going to be public in July or September, who will look precisely at these KYC aspects. So uh, as I don't hear in the panel any news on this and is not part of the conversation, I just wanted to flag it. Again, it's a European Commission initiative, it's not our group initiative, but we are talking to them to understand how to implement this in order to find the balance within the social inclusion you are mentioning, but also low. Um, so when you move money, uh, data protection is good, but fraud prevention is also very good. Um, if you happen to read the Payment Service Directive 1 from 2007, there is a very nice article, Article 72, which says data protection is fundamental, but if you have to prevent fraud, prevention of fraud comes before data protection. And that's where I think my group stands, so I just wanted to contribute to, to the discussion. Thank you. I'm not sure whether there are colleagues from the GFISMA now here, but uh, I remind that uh, the purpose of this workshop is to look at applications of blockchains for social areas beyond uh, financial applications, which, of course, is a subject in itself. Any other questions that we may collect? Um,
I don't have a Twitter account with me, so how can I ask questions? Yeah, right now, but I, I, when I asked before, I was being told to use Twitter, but I don't have it with me. So, that, that my, qu <laughs> my question, the, I, had, I had some questions, I was being told to put them on Twitter, but I don't have Twitter with me, so. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Is there another no, to uh, just interrupt or? Yeah. No, do it now. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, but, okay. But then I know for next time. Not everybody is on Twitter, so. Sure. Uh, anybody else? Please. Uh, was on that side, so I think there. Okay. Thank you, Thomas Arnold. I'm from DG uh, RTD, Research and Innovation from the Bioeconomy Directorate. So I have one question, uh, which is not so much directly on the financial system, but it's about food. So how could this uh, provenance technology and traceability modify our food chain, modify what we eat, and how quickly could this happen? Thank you. answer that yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I guess at Provenance we're working specifically on that question um, so we are trying to solve a tiny tiny part of it and I think the um, potential for blockchain to benefit uh, the food system is enormous and multi multifaceted um, so what we're looking at specifically is um, claims about food um, so a particular issue with food is proof of origin um, and proof of ingredients. So knowing that uh, you aren't buying horse when you think you're buying beef, for example. Um, and actually a lot of these issues are being flagged in um, regulation in the food industry at the moment, but there haven't been uh, many solutions presented previous to, to blockchain technology as to how to control um, the information that can feed into those regulations, um, mainly because, as I mentioned before, the, a, a top-down traceability system in the food industry um, is somewhat problematic when something like 85% of the system is smallholders. Um, so w just the aspect we're looking at, but I think this is a huge topic, um, is really to look at, see if we can uh, use um, a public ledger in order to, to share um, data on food provenance, um, mainly in order to help compliance with, with these regulations. Um, but also a, a big part of it is about trying to um, convey data not only down the chain using a blockchain, but also back up the chain. Um, and that touches on things like payments. Um, how do you know that uh, the, the thing you're buying, the farmer was paid correctly? Or how do you know that they're indeed farming the land they say they are? Um, yeah, I think it's, for, for me, it's just a fantastic tool um, to allow us to create more transparent food systems, which I think is paramount to food, the future of food. Hi, good afternoon. My name's, my name's Mark Smith and I'm from DG Connect. And uh, my question is, um, you uh, postulated the opportunity that uh, the European Union could potentially become a... Um, legislative cradle that would have a competitive edge against the rest of the world and given an example of uh, food chain um, in a particular case uh, the example you gave us with was um, monitoring um, fish uh, and um, fishing quotas and um, throughout the food chain within a given geographical location um, my question really is within the eu there are individual countries and member states um, suggesting that they want to control their data and all transactions on a geographical basis um, in order to understand what ge uh, jurisdiction that would lie underneath. So my question is um, based on the fact that blockchain technologies are essentially not just decentralized but also distributed. If you limited the distribution of the technology to a geographical location, would that reduce the nodes um, it, within the chain and therefore increase the likelihood that it could be corrupted. So explicitly with this example of the food chain, 
how did you overcome that um, a jurisdictional issue and a technical challenge of um, how the, the integrity of the record on an individual fish could be corrupted by a larger provider trying to gain a competitive edge? That's a really good question. Um, that's uh, several questions. Uh, so one on, um, yeah, corruption based on number of nodes. I'll leave that till sort of the end. Um, so it's a really good point that getting data into the blockchain, like the first incidence um, of that fish and its claims about it is sort of the most important thing of the whole thing. Because if you put garbage data in, you've got really secure, immutable garbage data being passed along the chain, um, which also isn't necessarily a problem. So we did quite a bit of work looking at what that means in terms of then creating resulting reputation systems based on immutable data, because you've then got a back record of what people claimed in the past, but that's another thing. So all, we were do all we're doing is overlying existing systems that are already um, operational in the field. We were looking at a very particular case, which is the first um, set of fair trade fishermen in the world. There are only 32 of them. So we had an easy monopoly on digitizing fair trade as a certificate in the field, which is obviously not the case for all, all fish, but I mean, we're, we're very much around proving particular certificates rather than mapping fish in general. Um, so here we worked on KYC and consensus on certain attributes with different NGOs that were already operating in the field. So there's a huge centralized aspect to this and we were just um, storing the, the resulting data from that in order to create a decentralized uh, chain of record along the supply chain. So the, the, we didn't change that initial um, data input part, but there's a lot we could talk about about decentralizing certification as well, but that's another thing. Um, yeah, I mean, so we were operating from the standpoint of companies and voluntary sustainability standards. So we didn't interface with government that much. Um, we were mainly just looking at how you could create a shared um, chain of record between those different individual parties. But I think there's, yeah, I, I think a lot could be achieved in to do this in, in uh, with the government heavily involved. However, the whole purpose of the, what we're doing is about s data spanning governments to try and create data sharing. So I can't really answer your question about if it was just internal to one country. Is that a start? Um, this is probably more of kind of philosophical type of question um, for the whole panel, but for Brett Scott in particular. I think the more I learn about blockchain and the more I believe that uh, relying on a perfectly designed system is a kind of utopy. And uh, it looks like we're assuming a lot of things that uh, the code is uh, trustable, that the code is unbreakable, that the code, I mean, while we know that there are bugs, that we know that not everybody's capable of understanding the code, you need intermediaries, yes, to understand what the code says. So uh, we have probably replaced the lawyers by the programmers, and we have probably replaced the code of law by the code of, uh, the rule of law by the rule of code. So I am more and more, um, let's say, wondering whether blockchain can deliver on its promises. So my question is, what do you see, or uh, what is the type of uh, real potential that you see in this type of technology, or do we need an upgrade of blockchain technology to address some of the issues that you have mentioned in your respective uh, presentations? Thank you. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to answer this particularly coherently. I mean, it's, it's quite a, a broad a broad issue. And I think there's a bit of a, a thing in this panel, which is there are particular applications, like what Jesse is doing, is a very sort of concrete example of a specific problem she's working on. And then there's this kind of like broader, almost like political economy question, which is the structure of the global economy and whether this fundamentally changes something about how business in general is done. Um, and um, I guess the claims that were originally made in the Bitcoin community came out of a critique of centralization. Um, and there are different conceptions of, of why centralization is bad. If you're a libertarian, a narco capitalist, you believe it uh, stops market processes. If you come from sort of radical anarchist traditions, you believe that centralization corrupts human beings and, 
alienates them from their social social nature. Um, so there's always sort of a, a different way, uh, conce conceptions of, of the, the centralization critique, but uh, decentralization then posed as the solving the centralization problem. Um, and I guess the stage we're at now is realizing that w even if your centralization critique is correct, it doesn't necessarily follow that decentralization solves your problem. Um, and I, I think that's the, the sort of the, the state that we're at. Well, I might say that what you're doing is decentralization. Yeah, uh, sure. That is, that, is, <laughs> that, is, that is, you discover re-centralization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to finish quickly. But um, I guess the uh, yeah, the, the philosophical question going forward is: Can you actually? And this, this goes beyond the blockchain community. This this is a, this is a movement in technology activism more generally. Um, there's been a decentralization movement in tech way before blockchain. When they realized that uh, the internet isn't actually a group of PCs linked together, actually what it is is these huge mainframe systems uh, acting as servers for all these client computers. Um, there's been a movement in the, uh, the sort of hacker underground was like, how do we, how do we solve this and re-decentralize? Re but the whole problem is people find it more efficient often to actually centralize. And you get, so you create decentralized systems. And you're often working against the grain of people's short-term interests. Um, so the naivety, I think, in the system is believing that um, merely providing the infrastructure creates, will, will lead to people seeing that it's in their interest to decentralize. Um, I'm kind of waffling now, so I'm just going to cut it there. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> we're fighting. I would like to also answer this question. I think that um, it's it, – like the the blockchain technology obviously has like some technical challenge which are being worked out. I think what is most important is not really upgrading the blockchain technology, but perhaps it's actually upgrading the way we think about it. And um, the the thing is that it seems that today there is this focus on decentralization, which used to be a means to an end, where the end is actual individual emancipation and disintermediation, but now it's actually turning into an end in and of itself. And um, of course, there are like some really, really useful uh, functionality that the blockchain provides, and this is in terms of transparency and accountability, data verification and uh, certification, uh, disintermediation and decentralized coordination, etc. The problem is that we also need to understand that this is not resolving everything. This is a really useful technological basis on which to build something around. And we do need some kind of social or institutional structure around this in order to actually operate in, in today's society. So I think at the moment it seems to me that because of the hype and whatever, like we, we kind of have lost the sight on why we actually wanted this technology in the first place. And it just has become the, the ultimate focus is the technology itself. But that doesn't mean that the technology does not have some really useful uh, functionalities, and I think we, we should understand how to best design an actual governance structure around those things in order to actually exploit the, those functionalities the best. Yeah, I would like to revisit a, a, a scary part of the blockchain, which is the scaling issue. Um, the, the problem is when we are working with the Internet of Coins and we're creating an integrated network of all these different blockchains, we already need massive amounts of storage space to just set up one node. Um, and I see this uh, uh, especially becoming a bigger problem as we start introducing data beyond just numbers into the blockchains. Now there's an option of course to just hash data and only store the hashes in the chain, but then the data will have to be passed around in another decentralized method. So um, and my question is, how do we make sure that this does not go the same way as communism, where the, the dream is great, it starts out good, but in the end, if, if you want to create, for example, unique car tires for everybody, because you want to be artistic, you want to be, have a high quality culture, you know, how are you going to get it done? And in this case, we're having different blockchains being created for all kinds of different purposes. Um, the scaling issue is basically the monster under the bed, which has not yet gone away. And uh, I'm just wondering, how are different projects looking at that? We have some time, so it's not like really dangerous at the moment, but it's going to become a bigger problem. Yeah, I can, um, uh, so I'm, I'm heavily involved with 
uh, Ethereum. Uh, so I, I, I can speak um, for the scaling uh, roadmap strategy there. Um, there are yeah, lots of things going on. So to some degree, you only need um, uh, specific data on the blockchain. So there's this concept of off-chain transactions. So you pass around signed messages um, that already give a guarantee that at any point in time it could be in principle enforced on the blockchain but because you have this guarantee you actually don't have to enforce it and you can continue do, to do uh, transactions and only do kind of a net settlement from time to time on the blockchain so that that's point point one uh, very important um, scaling uh, thing so for example your uber ride that there's absolutely no need that that will will should be stored on the blockchain and be visible to anyone and you only both parties want the guarantee that the other one is paying or having a specific amount of reputation um, the second thing is but but still the blockchain or the blockchains we will use will get that big that you that regular user would not uh, want to have a whole chain um, stored on it and then there are those concepts like sharding um, so the idea is that you only um, yeah, uh, store parts of it and there's a algorithm that guarantees that all parts are uh, somewhere st uh, um, uh, stored and, and you can create economic incentives to or economic guarantees or you, you insurances about um, data. It's, 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 it's complicated, <laughs> but it's solvable and it, or people are working on it. Um, and I'm, again, I, I would see it as the internet in the early days where you would say, well, can we really imagine that we would eventually watch movies o over this data uh, stream where we can now only uh, communicate a few bytes per, per second? And yes. Um, so I think it's important that we have information in as few places as possible. That is one of the conflicts that blockchain uh, creates um, in at least many of its uses uh, is that you have information in places where you don't want it to be, where it doesn't need to be, and where it is then forever. So tracking back to KYC, you've also got the problems of data security. And most actual actors uh, most actual institutional actors have got restraints that, that mean that they legally shouldn't have there. The GDPR will then impose that on everybody. Uh, and you might say, why do Europeans who, who transact with one another have their data in some place wherever it is sort of headed west? Uh, you can see, you can hear from my voice that I come from one of those western places. Um, the, uh, so there is, a, there is a profound conflict between um, the notion of uh, every node's got everything uh, and uh, my data should only be where it should be. So I think that the, uh, my understanding is that blockchain is necessary in certain kinds of, in certain layers like the Internet of Thing layer and it sounded to me like the fish layer. So we got the Internet of Things and the fish um, uh, where you really got to have blockchain but the, the point of blockchain and its consensus mechanism is uh, in order to be able to have uh, recourse to the valid record, to have some way of figuring out when, when people's opinions differ, uh, to be able to get back to some valid record. And if you have, and we have already, many institutions which are created um, and uh, which uh, serve some purpose of trust, um, you can then uh, probably solve the problem a lot easier. Uh, there are technologies such as Git which allow a um, traceability uh, and if you have some kind of point, if you have a what in the identity community, which is totally relevant to this conversation, if you have a notion of a trust provider, um, then you probably can have a much lighter weight and a much more data conserving approach. So I, I, I think that any blockchain discussion needs to be, uh, needs at the same time to be thinking about data, data uh, 
conservation of data. And I would say it was mentioned, uh, well, businesses care about this competitive aspect, but I would say that countries and continents also care about this competitive element. And I would say, with, particularly with the GDPR, if you take it from the perspective of, of making sure my data isn't in places that it doesn't need to be, um, that there's an opportunity here for Europe to lead in creating a, um, in a certain sense, uh, extremely decentralized um, uh, system of transacting. Can I, I just may. add very briefly, uh, very, very briefly, so partly for the reasons of scale, but for other reasons as well, that's why we don't think that one chain is going to rule them all. One chain is not what the world needs. It's like building one database for everything. It doesn't make sense at that level. So lots of different chains for different aspects will help your scaling problem. Thank you. We're going to take one last question. So you have to fight for it. No idea how I won that fight, but thank you. Um, uh, it, it strikes me that there's a community massively under underrepresented here, which is the community of algorithms. Um, we, we, I, I've written down the words that were most repeated, which is immutable and incorruptible. Now, I work in the European institutions, which are human institutions, and therefore massively mutable and eminently corruptible. And I keep thinking to myself, Who's representing the algorithms? Because this is the problem we have here. We're now in a symbiotic relationship with algorithms. As humans, we have created the environment in which they exist and evolve. But we're no longer the masters here. And I keep wondering if algorithms were having a conference, how they'd be addressing the problems with humans. I mean, algorithms are entirely reasonable. They do what we ask them to do. You know, they keep landing the plane. You know, if, 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 you, if, if we had blockchain to our, you know, Amazon and Facebook and their tax affairs, we would be receiving reasonable tax. I find it hilarious that we've got the financial services and IBM talking about, you know, know your customer and anti-money laundering. Give me a break. I mean, the, the nature of human systems is to be corruptible. The nature of algorithms is to do what they're supposed to do. And I think we might move forward a little better were we to try and put ourselves, maybe for the afternoon, in the place of the algorithms and think about how they would regard us. That's it. Sorry, can I add something to this quote? Um, I, I just want to give an example of another use for, blo for the blockchain that someone mentioned in terms of data. So if you look at storage, storage.io, um, they've actually been able to you know, store the files in shards in people's computers on their empty space that they can contribute to the network. They are then given a token that they can use to hire space on the same uh, network. And other people can also use it. It's been established with Microsoft Azure uh, for enterprise level, and it reached past 10% of the data that Dropbox was able to provide in 2012, and all of this is completely distributed. And you know the hash is stored onto the blockchain and the files on people's computers. And I think that's a really great example of uh, you know providing privacy for people at the same time security. And and one of my biggest concerns is right now, as as the other gentleman said, that people's private data, as you say, KYC is such an you know uh, honorary thing in your perspective. Um, but the data that is taken from people is somehow given to banks to be stored. So, for example, there was a gentleman in uh, Den Haag that said, uh, we set the standards and banks and institutions such as Barclay Banks um, store those data. So now banks have gone from you know storing people's money to also storing their private information and becoming the banks of data as well. And I see a huge conflict between when you, when you tie up these two portions of the paradigm together. And... Yeah, you know, I think if we're going to talk about, oh, we should watch out who's using the money and have a KYC, we should also look at what financial institutions have access to this money, what money do they make from selling this data and these, uh, you know, patterns of purchase and all these other things to local businesses and why aren't the people that are giving such data being rewarded for it. Um, and that's the whole paradigm of Bitcoin is that, you know, this is the middleman. If you remove it, shouldn't the customer be directly responsible for that and be rewarded for it? But somehow it's all passed on to the you know greater aspect of the financial 
uh, circle. Could I can I talk on, on on algorithms? This is too big a philosophical issue to get into to before before lunch. But um, I would disagree with your characterization to some extent. In, in my in my world, algorithms are are, are representatives of corporate management largely. Um, they're implemented. They're essentially they're essentially sort of middle management and perhaps even senior management below below the corporate execs, right? Um, and, and that's becoming, you have your corporate execs, your sort of senior programmer algo layers, and then your sort of, uh, uh, your crude machines at, and, and workers. Um, so I think that, that's potentially one thing to bear in mind. I don't think the algos necessarily have a world in themselves. Albeit, if you start to think at a systemic level, if you consider that humankind starts to um, lock itself into extreme reliance upon such systems, then there does a certain autonomy starts to emerge in the world of algos at, at a systemic level. And that's when you get into these kind of like sci-fi debates about AI and, and so on. Well, I, sorry, I, I wasn't, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just trying to suggest that it's there already. You know, I'd, I'd far rather have an algorithm land a plane than you. Or, or, or sorry, not, yeah, than me. Uh, I'm simply making the point we are already in this strange symbiotic relationship. We've no idea where this goes. We created the networks in which these things live. You know, you remember the bat, the flash crash, and so on and so forth. We, we're not quite sure what's happening anymore. So really part of the problem would be to try and look at things from outside the box, although um, J yeah, uh, Mr. Hazard there would, what would suggest that you know, I'm way too far outside the box. But it's interesting to conceive of how the world would look from the algorithm's point of view. We're messy, really messy. You know, so so we, we, we need to think about that. How do we compromise? I mean, I ride a bike to work every morning. At 7 o'clock, I go through every red light. Why shouldn't I? There's no cars. Algorithms wouldn't necessarily agree with me. So I think, I think we need to look at it both ways. Thank you. Um, okay, they're really, really... Uh, sorry, with this very hard discussion, I decided to also put a little comment. Um, I'm an uh, architect from a training background, so normally I am a user of all the data uh, you create, and system you create on the internet. However, uh, since some time ago, I started to develop a reality and uh, internet shared tools because uh, what we have discussed until now, I really very much miss a very important link, uh, the break block, uh, blockchains or the internet system, the link to their realities, to our reality space, because actually our reality space have the most important data information we can receive so directly. Imagine uh, even 100 years ago, 50 years ago, people did not have uh, so much computer. They were probably more happy than we are now. So. Um, I have some concrete suggestions, maybe, just thinking about uh, what I have learned today. Um, these systems, uh, I think, is, is, is very complicated to only test it more rely, relying on internet. You should find some places, you should link to some places and link some to, to some everyday activities, like a market. Maybe it's, it's difficult to just find one place to test this Bitcoin uh, concept, etc. But you can select several of them around the world so that people can share from faraway places. So I would like to, uh, much to share with you if you are interested with my Green Magnus, which is working on this as well, but from an architect's uh, perspective. Thank you. Um, we have a last question, but probably there will not be time for the answer, but the answer can be discussed during the lunch. So please go with the, you, you will have the last. Okay, thank you. I want to link this to climate change. Is there a possible application of uh, Bitcoin uh, technologies, of blockchain uh, chain technologies to log, to have a trusted log of the carbon footprint of a broccoli, of a steak, of anything we consume, which then could be used either for responsible consumer choices, but also for carbon uh, uh, footprint-based taxation, pricing, and whatsoever. Uh, how green is my broccoli? This is a perfect question to introduce the, the lunch. But this is actually a really interesting question, and I would like to have an, I, I would love to talk about this with you and many other people. Thank you. Yes. About the